Hello everyone. The Burning Legion has invaded Azeroth once again, and shamans are able to pick up three different artifacts to empower them in this war. For Restoration Shamans, it's Sharazdal, Scepter of Tides, formerly known as Scepter of Azora. It is said that Queen Azora wielded the scepter that had command over the sea and the waters of life. Erunak has long sought the location of this artifact, and one of his shaman was close to finding it when she disappeared. Had she found it? Could the legend be true? What could such an artifact do in the hands of a talented shaman? That's what we're going to discover as we join Erunak on this mission of not only saving Waveshpeaker Adelie, as well as collecting this artifact. This he, way, a peaceful I mind. spent many months in the depths of Ashir during the Cataclysm. It is like a second home to me. Erunak was a quest giver during the Cataclysm, where he joined us on our adventures within Vashir. The Naga were trying to claim dominance over the Abyssal Maw, the elemental plane of water, as well as its lord Neptulon. We tried to hold him off, but Ozumat was able to grab Neptulon as well as Erunak, and we had to venture into the Abyssal Maw to save them both. Within the Throne of Tides, we found Erunak under the control of Mindbender Gursha, but we kicked the creature off his face and we saved the Shaman. We tried to help Neptulon as well with cleansing his realm, but at the end of the dungeon, Ozumat showed up and he took the Lord of Water away. For years, fans speculated on what might have happened to him, but it seems like Blizzard has no interest in continuing this story, since Neptulon shows up safe and sound at the Order Hall. It seems like he saved himself from Ozumat's grasp and now the Naga armies are amassing again. We're sent out to find clues as to what happened with Adelie. Our missing shaman, wavespeaker Adelie, had tracked the scepter of tides to this sunken city before she disappeared. That is wavespeaker Adelie's staff. Hmm. It is attuned to the abyssal maw. Perhaps Sharistal is in there? I warned her not to go there alone. Adelie spoke of a powerful wavestone. I see now what she meant. The auras surrounding the stone would cloak one's movements from Neptalon, allowing the Naga to slip into his domain undetected. It is fortunate that Adelie's journal is written in waterproof squid ink. It will detail her search for the scepter. I will need time to look this over. Bring it to me. All the clues indicate that Adelie tracked the scepter into the Abyssal Maw. The trail is easy to follow. Perhaps too easy. We may be walking into a trap. Do not let we should make our way to the Throne of Tides within the Abyssal Maw, where this scepter awaits. We must be careful. I fear Neptalon's realm may be compromised. As we make our way to the elemental plane of water, let's talk about the history of Sharazdal. Once upon a time, the ancient Night Elf Empire was one of the greatest mortal civilizations that ever spanned the lands of Azeroth. At its highest point, just before its lowest, one figure held sway over all, Queen Azora. For days, the coronation ceremony went on. Each night, the highborn nobility left its precious gifts on Azora to curry her favor, but there was one she cherished more than all the others. A night elf named Lord Xavius, the same Lord Xavius that would become the Nightmare Lord, he presented the queen with a jeweled scepter etched with delicate magical sigils. He promised Azora that so long as she kept it close, it would bring her prosperity and great power. Ashura held the scepter aloft, and the jewels shimmered in the light of the moons like brilliant stars. The sight of the queen and her gift was so beautiful that it brought many of the attendant highborn to tears. Now Ashura, she was not only beautiful, she was also incredibly powerful, one of the greatest magic users who had ever lived. The Well of Eternity, a massive lake of scintillating energy and arcane magic, was part of the Night Elf studies, and Azora, she devoted herself to plumbing the well's depths in search of knowledge and power. As she honed her command over the lake's energies, she infused a drop of its living waters into her bejeweled scepter. Imbued with the Well of Eternity's potent waters, it held sway over the rivers and the seas, aquatic creatures of all kinds, and the life energies that stirred within Azora herself. She granted it a new name, one befitting its remarkable properties. She named it Sharazdal, the Scepter of Time. Now one of the first things Azara did with Shadows though was use its power to enhance her legendary beauty. 
As the years wore on, the queen seemed to grow younger and more mesmerizing. A brilliant aura enveloped Azara, enthralling those who looked upon her. The highborn marveled at this strange phenomenon, a few even took it as a sign of divinity, and even Illidan, with his magical eyes, noticed that Azara, she was using her magic to enthrall those around her. Next to that, she also used the staff to bring wonders to the world. Perhaps none was so great as Laza. As Masons constructed his temple, Azara shaped the waters around it with the scepter of tides. She spoke the names of the rivers and the seas, and they moved at her command. Salt water from the roaring ocean and fresh water from the mountain streams, it trickled to Azara's side. With the flick of her wrist, the queen partitioned them into great lakes that hugged Larfalazal's sturdy foundation. Creatures of all kinds populated these waters, and whenever the queen walked the bridge of Larfalazal, nearby schools of exotic fish arrayed themselves in colorful patterns. She even kept a colossal sea giant bound to one of the lakes, using her scepter to make it perform tricks and feats of strength. It's unknown what happened to this temple, but some speculate that Larval as all used to be what we now call Black Fathom Deeps, which is interesting considering the old god influence that now houses the area, as well as it makes a way better name, because who can pronounce Larval as all? As the Night of Empire stretched across the world, Azara spent more and more time in her palace at the Well of Eternity shores. She obsessed over the lake and used Shara's doll to manipulate its mysterious energies. Azara dreamed of making the world into a paradise, her paradise, but it would only be possible Possible if she and her highborn servitors could harness the Well of Eternity's true potential. Their reckless experiments eventually sent arcane magic crashing through the twisting nether into the realm of demons. In time, the Burning Legion learned of the Well of Eternity and the world of Azeroth. Azara's obsession with remaking the world led her straight into the clutches of the Legion's ruler Sargeras. The queen forced a pact with him for unfathomable power. All that Sargeras asked at return was for Azara and the Highborn to summon his minions into Azeroth. It was a difficult request even for such a gifted sorceress. Azar and a highborn approached the challenge with great fervor. Legends say that the queen helped her servants open a gateway for the Legion's agents. She used Sharazdal to gather the Well of Eternity's energies and fuel the highborn spellwork. This is actually a minor change to what they described in the War of the Ancients trilogy. There it was her advisor Xavius that showed her what they had found, that they had made contact with the Legion, and then Azara just let Xavius and the Highborn do the work, while she focused on dreaming what the future would be, what her future with Sargeras would be like. The only thing she did to make their dreams come true was suggest to seal off the Well of Eternity from the rest of the people so they could focus its power purely on creating the gateway and bringing Sargeras into the world. A minor change to the previous story and I personally like the idea of her doing more but as we know even with the queen aiding them their mission failed as the Knight of Resistance was able to close the portal and stop the Legion invasion. The enormous lake of the Well of Eternity buckled in upon itself eventually igniting a monstrous explosion that shattered the world's surface. Azara watched these events unfold from her broken palace. She refused to believe that her dream of paradise were dead, that the world she had once cradled in her palms was coming apart beneath her feet. Many of the highborn were just as delusional as the queen and they remained at her side. As the ocean roared in to fill the void left by the destroyed well of eternity, Azara raised Sharazal high and she wove a magical shield around herself and the highborn, saving them from being crushed by the colossal waves. But it was only a momentary reprieve. The howling ocean soon swallowed the queen, Sharazal and her followers. Then it sucked them down and down into darkness. They drifted into the abyss, but Azara and the highborn remained unbroken. The darkness around them was absolute and so the queen willed Sharazdal to bring them light. It did. Azara's and the highborn's blood ran cold and so the queen willed Sharazdal to warm them. It did. Their lungs burned for air and so the queen willed Sharazdal to let them breathe the water but it did not. The scepter could not save them. Oblivion spread its arms and beckoned the desperate highborn. As the ocean crushed the life from their bodies, ancient creatures stirred in the darkness. Their whispers flowed through the currents, their powers wrapped tight around the queen and her servants. The highborn became something new, something more. A fleece of scales shimmered over their skin, tails trashed against the currents. The unknown entities made the queen and her followers one with the sea. They made them into the Naga. Again, a minor change. In the trilogy, we read about the waters in the palace, Azara refusing to admit defeat and using her substantial power to shield them from the water. Drops of sweat started to appear, the first drops in her life as she tried to hold the shield against the crushing water. In that moment of desperation, whispers came to her, there is a way, you become more than you ever were, we can help. 
Azara was no fool, and she knew that the waters would eventually claim them and wash away the perfection that was Azara from the world. With a nod, she agreed, and she and the Highwater that followed her, they were transformed into the beings that we know them as today, they were transformed into the Naga. And when the time comes, for what we grant you, you will serve us well. The shield faded, the waters claimed them all, but they did not drown. So both stories lead to the same conclusion, but with some minor changes. We also need to keep in mind where the information comes from, whereas the new version for the artifact, that comes from a fragmented text called the Song of Skills. Either way, Azara and those that followed her were turned into the Naga, and they created a new capital called Nashatar at the bottom of the sea. <laughs> With patience and cunning, they expanded their dominion over the oceans. It's even said that Azara nurtured an alliance with the mysterious and powerful entities who had transformed them into Naga, and those entities being the old gods, mainly in the Zop. As the years wore on, Azara relied on Sharazdal less and less. She still treasured the scepter, but she found it was more useful in the hands of her first some sea witches. These loyal servants wielded Sharazdal as a weapon to spread the Naga's domain and crush all who opposed them. It was not long before the Naga sea witches learned to harness Sharazdal as Azara had. With a swipe of the scepter, they drove thousands of aquatic predators into a frenzy and unleashed them against troublesome sea giants. With a whispered incantation, they boiled Cavaldi raiders from the inside out and scattered their remains to the currents. When the sea witches were not wielding Shara's doll, Azara would often carry it at her side and reminisce about times long past. She still remembered Lord Xavius's promise. So long as she kept the scepter close, it would bring her prosperity and great power. The queen had lost much, but she was not dead. Far from it, in her heart, she knew that one day, her empire under the sea would eclipse even that of the ancient night elves. One day, the world would be hers again, and she would not let it slip through her fingers a second time. Sounds like this weapon has some good memories for the queen, let's make sure that she never sees it again as we enter the throne of tides in search for a missing shaman and the artifact. There we find that the naga are tormenting a poor sea giant. Fear not my enormous friend, the earthen ring is here. We mean you no harm giant. They control us. They kill! Shaman, speak with him. Perhaps we can gain a new ally down here. Grash, son of Gralashar, has seen Adelie and the scepter, which he calls a magic stick. The Naga snakes have been using it to control the sea giants, and those who try to find back, they get taken away, they get murdered by the Naga. We inform him that we have to kill this mean old snake witch, and we're going to take away the magic stick, and the giant will gladly help us with our mission. Okay. Well done, my friend. He has seen our missing shaman, and the artifact we seek. Now we must find a way through this ice barrier. Well, that will do. The giant has seen Charistal, the scepter of tides. We are close. Keep him alive, and he will protect us. The scepter of tides! It's here! I found it! They're using it to whip creatures of this realm into a frenzy. Sharastal is held by Lady Zithrain. She was using me as bait. We should turn back. This whole realm is a trap. You underestimate the shaman I have brought. No trap will keep us away from our prize. As we go further in, we take down Kralis the Moistener, and we take a bubble to the upper level. Our companions make sure to freeze the passage behind us, while in front of us, Zithrin is calling upon the waters to keep us at bay. Zithrin is trying to crush us beneath the waves! Shaman, lead Grash forward. He can act as a breakwater for us. Sharistal, the scepter of tides is steeped in legend. Through its power, 
Ashara enabled her followers to live in the sea. Is it dangerous? It has dominion of the waters of Azeroth, the very stuff of life. In the right hands, it could be a font of healing instead of corruption. Shara's doll is mine! For the glory of my queen alone! Lady Zithrin is in the throne room beyond. The snake witch, Lady Zithrin, is inside, and Grash is actually afraid. He fears that she'll control him with her magic stick, but we promise to keep him safe, and the friendly giant smashes the wall. Your cause is hopeless, sea witch. No matter how you bend the elements to your will, they will never truly serve you. Zifreen tries to use the elements against us, and she even tries to take over Grash's mind. But together, we are able to overpower her, and we ask her what Ajara was actually trying to do with the Realm of Water. It's over, Zithreen. Tell us, what did Ashara plan to do with this realm? I will tell you nothing! <laughs> Well then, I guess... I guess we're done talking here. Dead now! Take up the scepter, shaman. You have earned it. Feel its power coursing through you, shaman. The waters that Ashara tried to turn against us are now yours to command. <laughs> Magic stick! Come, let us return to the others. I never thought I would someday long for the peace and quiet of the Maelstrom. Grash hawks out before we can try to gain more information from Zifrin. So the question as to what the Naga were trying to do with Neptalon's realm, that one still remains unanswered. Perhaps the queen still holds on to her dreams of one day leaving the dark waters behind and reclaim the surface. She'll have to do it without her precious scepter, as shamans will now wield it in the war against the Legion and their adventures through the Broken Isles. However, those are the story for another day. So for now, thank you very much for watching everyone. Subscribe if you like my videos, leave a like if you enjoyed this one, and until next time guys, see ya!